Hi there, everybody. Welcome back to Leading Our Own Way. We're up to part three of this week's episode of the show. We're diving even deeper into our conversation with this week's guest. Let's continue exploring their inspiring journey. If you've missed part one and two, definitely go back and catch up. Also, if you're not subscribing, please, please subscribe. Enjoy the rest of the show. See you soon. I completely agree. I've seen I've seen it in the adult sense where I've been to meetings before and we've had lollies thrown at us to make us feel good for the meeting. But you still walk out feeling like shit because the meeting was always going to go the way it was going to go with or without the lollies. And I'm like, what the fuck? Like, you just do the big dopamine hit to get them. Yeah. Well, it's ticking the box, isn't it? It's it's yeah. ticking the box of what they're required to do by their their leaders. Uh, we need to consider the well being of the staff. All right, I've thrown them some lollies. Great. We'll have a quiz at the end of the month, and we'll have a team building. Even team building, no. Oh yeah, do it. I'm not saying don't do it. It's great and it's oh. fun at the moment, but it it's not. You can't you can't have that and everything else bad because. No. It's, it, it, most people probably won't want to go to that evening anyway. They'll probably feel more anxious going to that meeting rather than actually looking forward to going to the team building. So it's That's pointless. Right. Do you know right. what I mean? So all the money people, organizations spend on wellness programs and um, and biscuits for the staff room and things like that, they really need to think about how how are they spending their money on actually preventing mental illness in the workplace, preventing burnout, preventing, because these are drops in the ocean. And, and that's my hope is, is I, I want to create an embodied experience for a leader to know how to create safety, emotional safety in the workplace yeah. through connection. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, another thing, the education system, I hate doing they you know, they do one year contracts. Oh, I, and the way they hire people in that sense, oh, you've not made it. But then two weeks later, that person got a job mm. because one came available. Hold on a second. They've just known they didn't get a job two months, uh, two weeks ago, but now they've got a job. They still feel like shit. Mm. I, I, I see it every year. My eyes have opened up so much since becoming a casualty. It just reaffirms what I'm doing every single day mm -hmm. is the right thing because I'm not in that that chase of it. I'm completely in charge of my own destiny. and I, I, uh, what was that book called again? Anyway, I need to write it down. The whole, the whole brain child, the whole brain child. And who was the author? Sorry. Dr. Daniel Siegel. Dr. Daniel Siegel. Yeah. Like there's the... a female, there's a female co-author too. Uh, Tina. Well, I'm going to get her last name wrong. Tina That's Bryan. Right. I'll sort of put T, Tina B and it'll come up. Yeah. It'll definitely yeah. come up if you put, um, Dr. Dan Siegel. Uh, no, I like what you said about the brain there, because I'm, I'm, as you can see, I'm with my books. I'm definitely reading books about the brain quite frequently. So, um, I'm, I'm, and and it's kind of then travelled into the human biology. You know, things like mm. uh, preventing Alzheimer's and dementia and mm. cancer and all of those things. You know, but again, if we do this when they're young, kids will grow up leading a healthy. Do you know how many children I've seen today? Obviously, I can't go into details of you know because of privacy reasons, but you know. There's some children I come across that I get told whether it's the truth or not, they're riding bikes at 2 a.m. in the morning mm. around the streets. I can see where their life's going and they mm. don't see the value in their own life. These kids are walking around slumped and their faces and they're eating all this mm. sugar. Oh, it kills me. Mm. Absolutely kills me. Anyway, let's get back onto you. Um, all right. So a little bit about yourself then. Um, I know we're 50 minutes into the episode, but <laughs> your family, let's, let's see, uh, how do you, how do you prepare? Because obviously we talk about leaders being prepared for the day and how to inspire. You're, you're doing this every single day. How do you prepare for the day? And then we'll obviously, we'll dive into your family very quickly. Well, the season of life I'm in is I'm, I'm in the season of raising small humans. So I have a six-year-old, a two-year-old and soon to be a third. Um, Congratulations, by the way. <laughs> thank you. So um, I honestly, I, I have to try and wake up before my children because if I don't, then I start the day with my cortisol levels higher than they, than I ideally like them to be. <laughs> so um, I, for many years now, I have a pretty regular um, meditation practice, gratitude practice. Uh, gratitude has become a 
fundamental requirement for me to navigate the stresses of life. Um, particularly, I, uh, my husband and I, we lost a baby at um, 14 weeks gestation. Um, and that happened between my son and my, my daughter. And um, it was it was probably one of the most traumatic times of my life um, because it happened at home and I needed an ambulance and emergency surgery. And um, it was, it was, it was awful. Um, and since that experience, I realized after I had that experience, I realized I could easily get stuck here in this grief. I could easily get stuck in this place of, anger why why us why did this happen um doctors could give me no explanation the pregnancy was tracking along fine it was very unexpected um I could have easily got stuck in the just the, the grief um yeah. and it almost started to feel a bit comfortable if that makes sense what well, the grief um, felt comfortable in a way, yeah, like it was, it felt like I could just sink away to this place of where I didn't have to go out and connect with people. I didn't have to, I could just be in my own misery almost. And yeah. I probably stayed there maybe for three weeks, so three or four weeks. And I remember telling myself at the time, because I've worked, I work a lot with trauma, I remember telling myself at the time, Sherelle, you could get stuck here. Or you can you you need to give yourself a time limit and and then start allowing yourself to come back out of this. And the way that you come out of this is you must talk about it, or you must write it down. You must allow yourself to share, talk to as many people that will listen and write it and cry. I knew I needed to move through it so I didn't get stuck and it didn't become this ongoing core trauma for me. So I um, I think I gave myself about three or four weeks of just feeling sad and, and angry. And then I, um, at the time I had a three-year-old and there's a beautiful joy of having three-year-olds because um, he would pull me out of the 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 grief because he would want to dance and he'd want to sing and he'd want to look at the butterfly or he'd want to go and ride his bike so he would he it was very helpful having him because he would force me to engage and interact and connect with the world around me um but i i i felt like i needed this sacred place for myself so what i ended up doing was and i because i i know about what what I need to feel safe. I, I was feeling quite unsafe. When you have a miscarriage as a female, it feels, it almost feels like you, your body has betrayed you. <laughs> like there's a sense of unsafety that started to develop, to develop for me in my own body. Like I couldn't trust it. Um, and I couldn't trust that it would carry another child for me. So I, I almost had to create I had to come back to a sense of safety for myself in my own body. So every morning before my son would wake up, I'd set my alarm for five o'clock. He'd get up usually around 5.30 or 6. And I created this sacred ritual for myself where I would just wrap myself in this cosy dressing gown and I'd go to a corner of the house that I had made quite, had like a meditation cushion and it had incense. I'd light I'd light incense, I would create, um, I would make a cu cup of coffee and I'd put some meditation music on. And for some reason for me, it was like Native American Indian music, like that that kind of pan flutey, chanty mm. music. Um, it, it felt comforting at the time. And I would start my day like that every single day and I would journal. I bought a journal for myself and I would journal. And I'd journal everything that I was feeling and I'd let all that out. And then I'd end the journal with gratitude, what I was grateful for, what I was thankful for, what my body was doing for me that I 
that felt good, that I could trust, that my heart was healthy, that I would focus on what I was grateful for. And it became a very important part of my day. I would actually end up craving that time of that day for myself. I'd have, it would only be a bit for about 20 minutes or so, but just that sacred safety bubble I created. And I did it for about maybe two or three months consistently. And then I didn't need to do it so often. Um, but the predictability of the safety I would feel in that space every morning just built up this felt sense of safety that I was able to then connect in with the world again and start trusting my body again. And then, you know, we conceived our daughter about three months later and um, just her journey of her, her pregnancy Again, I, I, I had to really, I, I did yoga. I, I usually go to the gym. I stopped going to the gym. I, I went within and I did a lot of spiritual practices and meditation and yoga because I knew I just needed to hold myself in safety that entire time. And, yeah, my, so you, my daughter came you, into the world. And that's amazing. And, and, and thanks for being vulnerable there. Do, do you think that process of gratitude and journaling and, and, and that, those precious parts of the day in a way, I believe that's neuroplasticity because mm. you were rewiring your brain from that. I don't trust my body anymore to the pot. Well, the result of obviously your, your daughter being born, you've, you've, you've re because neuroplasticity yeah. can work for us or against us, can it? Yeah. And trauma can, you know, very quickly create a, I'm not safe uh mm. pathway in the brain right yeah. so i had to really work on creating that safety and i had to do it in my brain but also in my body because what we know about trauma is the brain has a response but the body remembers absolutely everything that we've ever gone through so i had to have this embodied experience of safety again mm -hmm. and i could only do that by doing it every day consistently at the same time so my body started to feel safe again does that make sense it totally does yeah, yeah absolutely so that's where i guess as well I really I'm, this is only coming to me now as i'm reflecting on that time but that that's really where the embodiment really came alive for me like I, my body needs to feel this repeated experience so just like it does in the therapy room uh, just like it does with parenting my children or just like it does um, when I'm connecting with people. I want to have this, people to have this felt experience of me where they feel safe with me. Does that make sense? Yeah. Totally. And I think that's what I'm trying, that's what I'm translating into the world of leadership is you have to, people have to feel safe in your presence. You can't just tick a box and, yeah, I feel safe today. It doesn't work like that. Mm. So, yeah, I think the journey of losing my, it was a girl, um, a little girl that we lost. My my son actually knew. he. Um, I was pregnant and um, he kept saying, Mom, I've got a little sister in there. And I said, do you? And he goes, yeah, and we didn't find out the gender. Um, so then, and, and he goes, and, and if it's a, and her name's Kaya, her name's Kaya, and she's my sister. And I said, oh, okay. And my son has always been very, um, he's a very compassionate, soulful, heart-led boy. And then when we lost the baby, um, they did an autopsy to try and work out w what happened. And they couldn't figure any, they couldn't figure out what happened. But um, they said, do you want to know the gender? And I said, I think I already know, but sure. Um, they said it was a girl. So we have we have Kaya, um, yeah. who is in heaven, and my son still talks about her. And um, but then Beautiful. we we had um, our little a little girl in on Earth come to us, and now we've got another one coming too. Amazing. Can, yeah. can I can I ask? Um, and and you obviously you don't have to answer it, but can I? How long in were you when you lost? Fourteen your weeks. 14 weeks. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So kind of, I, I guess as, as women, we, well, I, I 
I can only speak for myself and, and the women that are around me. But typically we get to that 12 week mark and we think, mm-hmm. you know, we're all, <laughs> everything's fine. Um, so I, it, it, it was unexpected. And, and actually I'd had it, I'd had an ultrasound just the day before and, and, and everything appeared normal. Oh, so, wow. Yeah. So it was, it was quick. That was, that was, I mean, that that's real quick, isn't it? Yeah, it was, um, it was, it was very unexpected. And, um, I still think back to that time when it happened and the, firstly, the shock, but then the anger, I've never felt so angry in my life. The anger I felt was, it was a rage. It was intense. It was, uh, it was, um, it was incredible, really, to experience. How was um, LJ, your husband, in all of this? He is the most safe, grounding person that I've ever known. Um, so he he just held he held the space for me, and that's exactly what I needed. And I think he's created more of a felt experience of safety for me, which I take into my leadership um, by how he helps people to feel in his presence. So he just, he just held me. He didn't say anything. (laughs) He, 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 oh, he said, I've got you. I've, I've got you. Um, I've got you. Like he just would, he was just saying that he wasn't, he, and we, you know, we called the ambulance and, um, I was out of my mind. I was certainly not, I was probably out of my body as well, to be honest. I was probably mm. quite dissociative. I was, I was, I was not connected to myself. So mm. I needed LJ to almost contain me and just hold and, and, um, not leave me alone. And, um, help me to feel safe in that way. Oh, well, I'm, I don't know what to say, but I'm I'm sorry that that happened to you guys. Um, yeah, I'm sorry Thank about you, that, all of that. Yeah. Um, where do you you work? Obviously, heavily with the brain and connection and so on. Outside of your work life, is there anything deeper than this? Where did the art? Uh, why did this become so close to you? What in, I, I I shouldn't ask why. What inspired you? in your life to go in this direction? I think, well, you know, for me and the attachment work that I've done, it all, for me, everything comes back to your childhood experiences and the relationships you have with your caregivers growing up, that, that shapes everything. And I'm, it's, it's never something that is used in, in a blame or an accusatory way but it's something that helps us understand. So I think for me, I was always, um, I think my mum has always said you were very independent and you always wanted to do everything on your own. And I reflect on that as a child. Um, and I, I can, <laughs> I probably was quite independent and didn't need her to do much for me, which I think has always propelled me forward in my life. But I think that came out of a necessity because I always remember feeling very uh, emotionally alone and emotionally isolated as a child. So um, I I do believe that, um, and I've talked about this with my parents as we've gotten older, but um, I, they, they provided me with everything, a really great education and um, a really physically safe environment, but um, the emotional connection was was certainly lacking and um, they didn't know how to hold my mind in mind or connect with me or empathise with me. So it, um, I always felt like I had this inner loneliness and um it probably wasn't until i became a teenager that i realized ah huh, i can 
find relationships with friends and family mem- uh, other family members and other f- friends' parents that help me to feel like I belong somewhere, that people get it, that help me to feel um, like I'm I, I'm a, almost like a, I'm I'm alive and I really matter. So um, teenage, my teenage years were really pivotal, I think, for me because they they connected me to some really beautiful friends, and those beautiful friends had beautiful families, and I um, was able to get a lot of my connection needs met through them. I'm still best friends with them today, so it. Um, that's great. They're still very important people to me. And, um, um, yeah, I think circling back to your original question, I can't quite remember what it is, Andy. Um, oh, kind of, well, you've answered it. And I think it's very crystal clear of where this, um, I suppose, art of connection and why you've gone into this in your professional life has, has come from. Mm. And you're absolutely right. How you started off was about going back to childhood. I'd say a good 90, I reckon 90% of my guests and you've just added to it. Um, it all comes back to childhood mm. for sure. 100%. I completely agree. And you've, you, that, well, that's your answer. That's where it is. When you went through those difficult, when uh, every child goes through a difficult moment, uh, and especially in the teenage years and young adulthood, um, did you get that support from them whenever you're going through it? I don't know. I, I can't think of scenarios a, a, a teenager would go through off the top of my head, I suppose. It's been a while since I've been one. Um, but I remember going through little breakups of girlfriends when I was 15, 16. It broke um, my heart. I'd be lying in my bed for weeks. I don't know. You know, um, really dwell on stuff. I remember dwelling on stuff. Um, but, you know, my mum, I can say it because my mum would probably agree. Um, she's always dwelled on stuff. Mm-hmm. So that's probably mm-hmm. where I get it from. I, you know, mm-hmm. I hold on to things. If I upset somebody, it really bothers me for, mm-hmm. you know, not so much anymore because I've worked on it. Um, but for years, even coming out here, seeking connection with people when I didn't know anybody in Australia, I probably was probably overbearing. Like, do you want to go out for dinner? Come on, let's go and get a drink, you know. But yeah, sorry, those difficult moments growing up for you, were they, did, how did you navigate those moments? Because I'm sure you would have had some. Um Definitely. You know, I don't think I'd ever go back to be a 14 year old teenage girl. <laughs> it's such yeah. a hard time. Yeah. Um, it, it's a very difficult time of development, uh, those adolescent years. And I, uh, I think that was where the, it really started to become very clear to me that my, and, and, and my mum and I have talked about this a lot now, cause she's just the most beautiful grandmother and I love seeing the connection she has with her grandchildren. Yeah. Um, but she, she, she just didn't know how to do that with me. And um, so it was often when I had hard times, it was often, you'll be right. You know, it was, it was just kind of brushed off um, or, uh, or it was, um, well, what could you do differently next time? Like it was a very problem solvey approach and all I really needed was just to be held. And I guess how my husband does it for me now and just being, I got you, like, we've got this. Yeah. You're going to be all right. Like we're I'm, here. I'm reflecting on me being a dad. I'm probably, I'm probably like what your mother was to you, to my boy. Look, oh. I hug him. And and I say sorry because I don't remember really many times I was said sorry to or, you yes. know, I was hugged and stuff, but I don't really, really remember being told sorry. I don't know. Maybe they just never did anything wrong to say sorry to me. I don't know. Maybe I'm overthinking it. <laughs> but um, I, I, I do think I'm probably old fashioned with my son, but completely different with my daughter. I, I, is it that, that stereotype of be, you know, come on, you got this, like you, you want your boys to be boys mm. and grow into men. Maybe that's wrong. I know me, I don't want to get canceled for saying that, but, and then I'm with my daughter that she's brought out this soft side of me mm. where I do hold space, but I, I definitely consciously have to think with, uh, with, you know, with Drew, my son, I make sure you hug him before mm. you go. Why did you do that? <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I do find myself doing that sometimes. And I suppose being conscious it, conscious about is the first step right of, of making yeah, it better awareness yeah yeah awareness yeah. I think that's some automatic programming that like because we all have this default mode right where it's like we're on our default setting 
that we, we're just playing out this programming that we've constantly been in from our own parents and our own uh, what was done to us. So do you think it's a bit of, you know, what your dad, how your dad was with you and it's just kind of automatically coming through? Well, I didn't, uh, it, it, you know, again, he won't mind me saying this because it's the truth and we've had discussions over it, but I didn't meet my dad till I was about eight or nine. Uh, so I didn't, I didn't grow up with that father figure in the house. So I feel like whatever I'm doing, I'm doing firsthand. Yeah. Um, you know what I mean? Like yeah. you'll see some pictures behind me of Michael Jordan and stuff like that. He was the guy that I really looked up to growing up. I, I know My that man. sounds a bit cliche, but just the way he acted, the way he played the game that I mm. loved, I mm -hmm. took into my life and, mm. and, and kind of mimicked that. I know that's nothing to do with fatherhood, but that's all I had. Right. And um, I kind of used that. Um, I did have a, my mum did have a partner uh, that I would have, probably classified as my dad but they split up and but because they split up we split up yeah and i didn't think that was fair because yeah i looked at him as you know my stepdad and i, I did look did. i never looked at him as yeah yeah they split it's up and, of a connection wasn't it i was like yeah wow yeah, mm. uh, yeah. And we, I, you know i've got him on facebook and he's such a nice guy mm. but i don't think they realized the impact that would have had on me yeah everyone was kind of taking care of themselves but i don't believe anyone really took care of me in this whole scenario and they've all got their old sides of the story and, and and i've said quite openly i understand your side of the story now i've got that perspective as an older man that's right nobody looked after an eight-year-old little boy at the time mm. and i don't care if that hurts their feelings i don't care if that, well i do but mm -hmm. i don't care what they've got to come back to me on because at the time I'm sure you've got your side of the story of why you were hurt, mm -hmm. but nobody took care of that little eight-year-old boy to make sure yeah. they both had the mother and father in that picture. Yeah. It's yeah. that simple, you know? Yeah. And yeah. I've, I've, I've lived with that. I think I got hypnotized not long ago when we brought up that scenario, and that's probably mm -hmm. where my fear of unknown or fear of mm -hmm. belonging has probably come from a mm -hmm. little bit. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, yeah, I don't know. You said about having that conversation with your parents you did say it with mm -hmm. your mother but earlier you said parents mm -hmm. um, how did they react uh, was that a difficult conversation or and if it was or wasn't how did they react to you being open vulnerable and honest with them join us tomorrow to hear more from today's incredible guests and learn valuable insights to help you lead your own way don't forget to subscribe we'll see you then